This episode is brought to you by our partners at Core Wireless. They want to let you know that Twilio SuperSim is now Core SuperSim. On June 1st, Core Wireless acquired Twilio IoT and with it, the simplest solution for connecting your hardware reliably around the world. SuperSim is a single SIM that gives access to over 400 networks, including the top three tier one carriers in the US. Automatic network failover means maximum uptime for your devices. And getting started is easy. Just go to corewireless.com slash SuperSim dash IoT for all to sign up for the free trial of the new Core SuperSim. That's corewireless.com. That's core with a K slash SuperSim dash IoT for all. Welcome, Nick, to the IoT for All podcast. Thanks for being here this week. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Um, before we get into the conversation, I'd love it if you would just uh, give our audience a quick uh, introduction about yourself and the company. So, uh, name's Nick Tumilovic. I am the Director of Product Management at iTrum. And uh, for the past uh, few decades, I've been uh, providing uh, technology solutions to really help yeah. the evolution of the kind of energy uh, transition. And so 20 years ago, that was a slow roll. And today it's, uh, it's, it's moving at a very fast pace. As far as what I'm doing today at iTrum, uh, there's four pillars uh, to what we're working on today. So for the past 40 years, iTrum is uh, really well known as being a metering company, mm. providing advances in smart meters like advanced meter reading, uh, advanced meter infrastructure 1.0 for the past 20 years. And today, what we call as an industry advanced meter infrastructure 2.0, uh, which effectively, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, is effectively putting an embedded server within the meter, which is now effectively an energy resource gateway. So, so that's um, kind of the, the story of iTron. And within that, in distributed energy management, we do energy forecasting for the past 30 years and for the past 15 years, uh, demand response. And now... DER management and what we'll be talking about today, which is electric vehicles. Yeah, fantastic. So let's uh, go ahead and dive right into to the conversation around electric vehicles. Um, one of the things that I know is important to kind of address and maybe just explain at a high level to our audience is with more electric vehicles out there on the roads being adopted, the the energy grid needs to be prepared for that. And if you could explain just for audience who may not be as familiar what that exactly means, like how those two tie together, what's important to note, what needs to be done, and then how um, how IoT technologies are playing a role in preparing that grid for that increased adoption of electric vehicles. Yeah, no, those are great questions. And I think um, it's a good opportunity to just try to clear the air because a lot of media... Um, whether it's news or social media, likes to kind of blast these broad brush strokes as it relates to, can our grid handle it? And uh, like any good engineer would respond, well, that really depends. And it's very specific to geography and, uh, and the, you know, the, the infrastructure that you have to be able to support that new load. So, um, you know, we, this is not our first rodeo as an electric industry. We experienced this back in the 1950s when this thing called the air conditioner became cheap and, you know, and, and, and ubiquitous and became widely available. And so we found ourselves in a position kind of on our, you know, heels, so to speak, to perform transmission and distribution upgrades to accommodate uh, all of those new electric loads. And in the very similar vein, you know, we're, we're back here in the 2020s with a new load, uh, arguably a much larger load, you know, potentially up to 20 kilowatts per vehicle. And the, I think the message and uh, what we can do as an industry, and iTron specifically is looking at, is how we can effectively build that bridge. We can still look at one, three, and five-year regulatory cycles to put in to do transmission distribution upgrades. Um, as a matter of fact, today, if you want to hook up 20 buses in New York City to have the, give the kids a clean ride to school this fall, you're waiting somewhere on the order of uh, three to four years to get those uh, infrastructure upgrades in place. So the bridge there is software and, and building confidence that there's a utility-grade software applications and tools that we can use ju to just ensure that those 20 buses don't charge at the same time. They still get to school. Um, but it's just a matter of putting in the right algorithms and the right computation to optimize that charging. And uh, 
talk to me a little bit more about kind of where IoT technologies are kind of playing a role in this and kind of in what what how they how that all fits together. And I think what's really typical is uh, we're dealing uh, a lot with this, uh, I guess, this continuation of cloud integrations and APIs. And so we have devices in the case of electric vehicles. It also extends and applies to PV, solar, or stationary storage, a battery that might hang inside of your garage. And today, uh, aggregators are connecting to those edge devices, providing those APIs, and companies like iTrum are aggregating all of these uh, device information so that way we can control uh, those elements. Uh, in the case of a, bu of a EV bus, you know, the EV supply equipment or the charger itself. Oftentimes, we today can also um, interrogate and provide command and control directly to the bus through telematics. Those are a couple different options of, of how we're kind of bridging that gap today. If the necessary steps to, to prepare the grid for this adoption of EV uh, is not done, done correctly, done, done well, what, what risks does that leave us exposed to? Um, and just again, talking in it from like someone who's very new, to not really understanding all this, because honestly, I, I'm not sure how many people really put two and two together that more electric vehicles means obviously more, more energy demand and how that affects the energy grid. I think a lot of people just take it for granted that they can just go plug their car in and charge things. Their house is going to be fine, you know, but obviously this is going to have an impact. So what's that risk kind of look like for not, not addressing this or doing this correctly? This is a great question. And I think it really comes to that green box that might be sitting in your backyard or that green or that gray canister that's sitting on the electric pole you know above your street that is the uh, the constraint and if that you know is I, has a 100 kva you know a uh, uh, marker on it then you can quickly run the math and say well after five vehicles at the end of this cul-de-sac you're, you're starting to overload that transformer and so I think what answer to your question is that if you ignore that and you're not proactive, then you could potentially suffer from uh, an outing. So I think what we're offering at iTron and across you know the industry is let's be proactive about this and let's generate heat maps to see which communities, specifically which transformers are starting to you know, uh, heat up faster than others and let's surgically strike so that way we can give customers the choice and, and the comfort um, that they need or the reliability. When it comes to the, I guess, the technology and the solutions in the IoT space, what exactly, where's, where's the big value that they're providing in all of this? Um, and we've actually, I've spoken to some people many, many months ago who have built grid management or grid monitoring solutions with IoT technologies. But I'm just curious to expand on that a bit more to, to understand that as EVs grow, um, how IoT will continue to probably play a role and continue to provide access to that data and information that allows this to scale as more vehicles hit the market and more things are pulling on the grid's energy. That's a great question. So I think, you know, the way this really started is we always throw hardware at the problem, Linux embedded servers, and now you've got points of failure. Um, you've got, you know, twisted pairs that are communicating through some, you know, standard or proprietary protocol. So we're moving now, I think, away from um, all of this, you know, science experiment, so to speak, but that, that's that worked effectively, you know, for the past, uh, you know, 20 years or so. Today, um, as I mentioned, a lot of this is going to the cloud through APIs. Um, a lot of these device manufacturers are uh, leveraged that as part of their business model to sell those APIs and, and grid services, if you will. There are some limitations with that, however. So if you happen to be a utility that really needs high fidelity, low latency data and, and, and real-time stream, that's where Companies like iTron come in, um, and, and specifically, as I mentioned at the beginning, we now have a meter. You take a customer profile or a program, you drop it in at the meter, then drives outcomes and results by communicating directly to those devices, call it a school bus. But furthermore, it's doing that uh, in context of the grid conditions. So how loaded is that transformer? Do you have any 
thermal or voltage violations. And, and so with that, now you have the ability to kind of have that 360 view really telling that bus when, when and where to charge. Now, when it comes to the challenges of this type of kind of solution that, that needs to be or that is being built and being, being done for the adoption of, of electric vehicles, how does, does the, I guess, diverse nature of the different types of vehicles, the different um, models of vehicles, the, the firmware, the energy that is required for each of these vehicles when it comes to charging, how does like, that diverse nature of things affect solving this problem? There's two components to that, right? And so one is there's a technical component, which is, are we going to go down the road of, you know, proprietary protocols and uh, capturing that, you know, by each make? Is Ford going to do something different than GM, which is different than Tesla? So we have to be mindful. Um, ideally, as an industry to move forward together, we would all, you know, approach some sort of sense of uh, industry standards, which I think is what we're really shooting for. The second vector there is the business model. So we have a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a elephant in the room, if you will, happening right now between who owns the customer. Is it the electric utility? Is it the vehicle OEM? And so how do we work together? And ITRON's trying to figure out with those two entities, how can we, you know, move together to just be able to manage this so we can allow you and, and your audience to adapt as many electric vehicles as they'd like in the service territory near them. A lot of times when we'll talk about it with, with IoT solutions technologies are, are different standards that kind of a, that fall into place for, for, for bringing new technologies to market, how they work together and how they get adopted. Is there kind of similar situation in, in this space as regarding just industry standards that need to be followed or, or things like that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I won't bore you with all of the or technical details of all the different standards that are out there, but, you know, you, you have your standard, like, you know, your, your, your UL, Underwriter Laboratories, you have your IEEE's, you have your um, IEC's, as well as, uh, you know, maybe like the CSA's of the world that have these, that the challenge there is that this can take, you know, five to 10 years for a lot of these standards to be adapted. So this is a, one of the challenges. And in the meantime, uh, what we're trying to do is just move forward to just demonstrate, especially to the grid planners and the operators that they can develop confidence in this managed software type of situation. And ideally, skate to the puck and be able to do this uh, in a local and an autonomous way in the event that the cloud can't be relied upon. It's kind of in that same kind of thought regarding communication protocols, which is, again, another thing that we talk a lot about in, in IoT. Um, how do you, how, how is it being handled when there are um, proprietary protocols, custom APIs and things like that working in kind of the same environment to be able to, to kind of solve this, this, this problem? Well, I mean, the first thing I think that's a challenge is that it always adds cost, right? So when we have proprietary protocols and we have uh, customized integrations that need to happen, then <clears throat> this kind of slows, I think, down what we're really trying to do here is uh, we have really aggressive decarbonization goals. Um, and so how are we going to be able to accommodate, you know, the 4 million vehicles in the U.S. today or the 10 million vehicles globally that were sold this year and 35% year over year growth next year. So, um, to, so really need to reduce that cost. We really need to standardize. Um, so it makes it, it makes it more challenging. Uh, the good news is, is I think we're getting better at some of these API integrations to the devices. We've had a few years, you know, to develop these, these APIs, but in the end, I think, um, that's going to suffer a bit from that real time automation that I think is going to be requested um, it, now and, and in the future. One of the last questions I wanted to, wanted to ask you before we um, kind of transition to wrapping up here is how how do you kind of see the industry evolving when it comes to um, kind of OEMs, electric utility, just different types of kind of the industry shifting and kind of that battle for customers. How is that kind of being viewed, or how is that a challenge in this space as well? That's tough, and that's um, that that's a that's a that's a very large question to address. And I think uh, one thing that we I think as Itron are recognizing is that most 
of our customers today at iTrap are utilities or cities. And so we have that ability to provide programs for their customers. And now we just need to bring in the device uh, integrators, make some models into that fold. So a vehicle OEM would be a good example of one of them to say, hey, uh, Utility X and iTrans managing some programs has you know thousands of vehicles under this make and model. Let's work together to find a way to, to make uh, make it mutually beneficial for both the vehicle OEMs um, and, and the utilities, and most importantly, for, for the customer who is buying the electricity and for the customer who bought the vehicle. Where do you kind of see all this going, just generally speaking? I mean, obviously, adoption of electric vehicles is increasing, and um, this is going to become more of a, of, a, of a challenge that needs to be solved, not just the grid preparation, but just, just kind of across the board. There's going to be challenges, I'm sure, that come up. Um, what does the future outlook kind of look like, or, or how, do you, how do you all kind of view things as far as where we're headed, where we're going over the next you know, 12, 18, 24 plus months? I think in the next few years, what we're going to start to see is uh, a lot of pressure being put on utilities to accelerate the adoption of EVs, or you're going to start to see, um, uh, even through interconnection processes, uh, customers requesting, I, I really invested in this, or a state has provided funding for X amount of, of you know, municipal buses, and they can only interconnect a few. So that, that is going to be, in the very near term, utilities uh, and these fleet owners and operators or, or light duty vehicle owners like you and me are going to be requesting that we um, are not delayed uh, by the incapabilities of the grid. So hence building out that solution. And I think over time, as we've demonstrated with stationary storage, big batteries that are deployed to the tunes of gigawatts today, we had the exact same problem seven years ago and nobody trusted it because that is the job of a grid operator is to see it not only as an asset but it truly is a liability because batteries can do both things go both ways if we can do that same thing carbon copy it do it with batteries on wheels i think we're going to be better for it and then finally i think um we're actually demonstrating it right now with six million meters deployed across a dozen utilities is that local control and the automation that, that I spoke of. So I think really that's where things are going to be headed in the future because it reduces the cost, it reduces the level of effort, and it allows customers to adopt what it is they want to adopt with uh, the existing grid that we have. Great way to break all that down. Um, this is a topic that I know needs, needs definitely more discussion around it for sure, given the growth of electric vehicles. And I don't think many people really consider the impact it has on and requirements that are needed to make this actually a sustainable thing as adoption grows. So I'm um, glad we were able to have a few minutes here to kind of chat and kind of provide some insights for our audience. Um, if our audience wants to follow up on this conversation, learn more about what you all have going on, just kind of touch base in any way, what's the best way they can do that? Yeah, you can always uh, reach out to our website at itrom.com. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever, we also have a, a good team on staff and we can we can publish that later uh, for follow-up. Well, Nick, thank you again so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it and excited to get this out to our audience. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it.